With the Wii U finding little success when it first launched, it meant Nintendo had to devise different ways to make sure the console didn't die out. Nintendo now has a reputation of making more kiddie games, which has stopped a large percentage of gamers buying any of their consoles. Mainstream gaming is more about violent games at the moment, which means while Nintendo still puts out fun, well-made games, they can't compete with franchises such as Grand Theft Auto. The main strategy that Nintendo decided to take is to branch out with their franchises more. They are in possession of some of the most famous gaming franchises, but have only allowed third-party developers to touch them from time to time. There was The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons, Oracle of Ages and The Minish Cap which were all made by Capcom. While these were all great Zelda games, Metroid Other M didn't work out as well, so I would say that Nintendo's track record for giving third party developers their IPs have been mixed. This brings me to the latest third party Nintendo game, Hyrule Warriors, which is a mix between The Legend of Zelda and the Dynasty Warriors series. It was hard to have an opinion on this game when it was first announced as, just like a lot of people, I really enjoy Zelda but couldn't even pretend to care about Dynasty Warriors. It looked good enough and the trailers looked cool but I couldn't get too excited as it's still weird that this game exists and actually came out. Either way, now that it did come out, did the crossover work? Was it a good idea to let another developer make a Zelda game or is it a stain on the franchise? Let's have a look. The story of Hyrule Warriors starts with Princess Zelda trying to seek out the legendary hero of time. As she discusses this with Impa, Hyrule Castle is attacked by an evil wizard brilliantly named Wizro. During the attack, Wizro manages to kidnap Princess Zelda, so Link and Impa pursue the wizard with the Hyrulean army. The story has a very basic start to it, but it's not long before everything goes crazy, with Hyrule covered in darkness and three time portals called the Gates of Souls opening up, which linked to previous game in the series. This means that characters from Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask and Skyward Sword are all present in the story. Everything that happens in this game is non-canon, so you don't have to worry about the Zelda timeline for this one. Overall, I would say that I enjoyed the story. It takes all the basic Zelda elements, Legendary Hero, Princess Zelda, the Trifles, etc, and makes everything over the top. If this was a traditional Zelda game, it would feel like a cop-out, but as a spin-off they did a good job of making a Zelda story that still features a large range of the characters from the series. Whether it takes things too far is up to you, but for me, having all the characters fighting in an all-out war was pretty cool. The main thing I found odd about this story is that it essentially has two endings though. There are a few new characters here, with the main two ones being Lana and Sia. These new characters have their own resolution about two thirds into the story, and it feels like the game is going to end. However, the story just keeps going, and then there's a more standard Zelda ending later down the road. It's a little strange that they created a new villain only to have the villain's ending be completely separate from the actual ending. Either way, the story serves its purpose of letting the player play in locations and characters from the different Zelda universes, without being too stupid. Well, with scenes like this one, it definitely still gets a little silly. Hyrule Warriors is a third person hack and slash game. The gameplay and level design is based off Dynasty Warriors, but there's a large amount of elements from The Legend of Zelda thrown in. There are 14 levels, or stages, which are large open areas where two armies battle it out. Across each stage are keeps and outposts, which spawn new soldiers. You capture a keep by taking out a certain number of enemies in the keep and defeating the keep boss when he appears. During stages, you are always given a specific task of what to do, which could involve capturing one of these keeps, or tasks such as protect a certain ally on the battlefield or defeat a certain enemy character. All of these tasks will involve slashing through a large amount of enemy soldiers, so that's what you spend 90% of your time doing. Before I talk about the combat, I want to say that the way the levels are structured feel like a missed opportunity. There's very little freedom in the game to shape the battle in your own way. You can capture keeps even if you're not told to, which helps out your side, but for the most part you're just going to the part of the stage that you're told to go, and if you don't fulfill the specific objectives, you end up losing. I don't mind this for the story mode, but there's no separate mode where you can just battle against other armies and use your own strategy. I really like the Battlefront games, and when you're playing a battle in those games, smaller skirmishes would naturally occur for certain outposts, which made battles unique and engaging. You had to respond to enemy movements and make smart decisions, as well as making sure you were killing enemies efficiently. In Hyrule Warriors, you're following orders constantly, making every battle the same. When I'm playing a game where I'm a soldier in a large battle, I want it to actually feel like a battle, not just a linear set of events. This doesn't ruin the game for me, but it does stop the game from having replayability, and it left me wanting more from the restrictive level design. 
Right, now that I've got that complaint about the level design out of the way, let's move on to the combat. The Y button is your standard attack, the X button is your strong attack, and the B is your dodge, so you can evade attacks. Once you defeat enough enemies, you can also unleash a large powerful attack by pressing the A button. The combos in the game use the X and Y buttons. You press Y a certain number of times to attack, and then you end up your combo with a more powerful attack that you use by pressing X. The powerful attack that you finish your combo with depends on how many times you press Y beforehand. It's a simple way of doing combos, and it allows the players to pull off all the over-the-top moves that the game has to offer without being too much of a headache. It also means that no matter what character you're playing as, it won't take you long to learn their best moves as the combos just involve tapping X and Y and seeing what's good. There are also four different types of enemies that you will face, soldiers, captains, story characters and large bosses. You will spend most of your time fighting soldiers and captains, with the other two being reserved for boss fights. The soldiers are the most common enemy, and they're really just there to fill space and help it make it feel more like a battle. They do occasionally attack, but they mostly follow other characters, and a lot of the time they will just stand there and do nothing. You'll be defeating hundreds of these soldiers in each battle, so if they did impose too much of a threat, it would get annoying fighting them all. But having them do next to nothing does mean that fighting them isn't that satisfying. The captains will actively attack you, with each type having their own style of fighting. They're also not too much of a threat, although fighting them isn't too mindless. I do like the combat, as it's hard not to enjoy yourself when you're taking out over 50 enemies with one flashy move, but it's a combat that doesn't feel rewarding. I didn't find the combat too repetitive like other people have, as I jump between a few different characters that have their own movesets and control differently. It's also the fact that the moves each character has are imaginative and cool to see, and this definitely helps make the game fun to play. Whenever you have to fight a story character, it's essentially the same as fighting a captain, but they're stronger. You have to block or evade their attacks, and use the lock-on to keep them in focus. When fighting any sort of boss, the trick to them all is attacking them to when they're stunned. Bosses have large health bars, but at certain times after they attack, or after you attack them with the right item, a separate meter will appear above their head. If you attack them enough to drain this meter, you will do a special attack on them which will take down most of their health. To say that you will need perfect timing to beat bosses would be a bit generous, as bosses aren't subtle about telegraphing their attacks. The larger bosses require you to use a specific item on them at the right time to stun them, rather than just attacking them at the right time. The items are all taken from previous Zelda games, so you've got the bombs, bow and arrows, the hookshot and the boomerang. Each item is surprisingly versatile, as they're needed to defeat bosses, finding items such as hard containers hidden in stages, and can be just useful in normal combat. My main complaint about them though is that changing item can be a pain. It's done by pressing the D-pad underneath the left analog stick, which is not comfortable to use. It doesn't help that you have to press the D-pad once before you can even start going through your different items, so if you want to change your items during a fight, you're either going to have to stop attacking enemies or stop moving. While I'm talking about the controls again, there is something I found odd about them. As stages are quite big, if you run for a few seconds, you start to dash, so that lets you get across battlefields much easier. Having a dash is a great idea, but it's purely done automatically, and I think it would have made the controls feel more natural if there was a button you could hold to make you dash, as every time you have to dash, you have to jog for a few seconds before. Changing items in the dash are nitpicks at the end of the day, but they are basic control issues that could put some people off. For every enemy you take out, your character gains experience, which helps you level up. Characters only have one stat, their strength stat, that increases when you level up, so you'll most likely ignore what level your characters are. You can still upgrade your characters though using materials and rupees. Rupees can be found all over stages, and the nice thing is that you don't have to collect them. Whenever they appear by defeating an enemy or smashing a pot, they automatically get added to your wallet. When you defeat certain enemies, they will drop a material. In between battles, you can then combine different materials to give your characters upgrades. These can be anything from learning new combos for certain weapons, to giving yourself better defense against elements. You can also find different weapons, each with their own skills, that you can combine with other weapons to make more powerful ones. This means that you have to keep an eye out for any drop materials when fighting, as it's the only way to fully level up your character. There's not much more you need to know about the RPG elements, except that they do a nice job of making the player feel stronger as they play. This is mostly because a lot of the upgrades do change the gameplay, such as the new combos that can be unlocked. The upgrades are the same for every character, so it can be slightly annoying once you unlock all 13 different characters having to apply the same 13 upgrades, but overall it's fine. Let's move on to the different game modes. 
The Legend mode is the story mode where you play through different stages and watch cutscenes. It's a decent length story taking me around 7 hours during my first playthrough. There are also gold sculptures that can be found in levels. There are initially only one in each level but once you beat the story there will be an additional sculptor that can only be found by playing on hard. It means that you have to play the game twice to get 100% but you're free to ignore the second wave of sculptors as they're not linked to unlocking levels or characters. The free mode is where you can replay the story levels but you can play as any character you want and you can also play them in two player. In two player one person will be on the gamepad and one on the TV. In single player the game is visually quite impressive especially with how many characters appear on screen at once. However in two player mode the frame rate and the character counts take a hit. It doesn't ruin the two player but it's quite jarring the first time you play it. The main problem with the multiplayer is that there just isn't any competitive modes. You're always on the same team achieving the same objectives. As there are only so many story missions and they're much easier in two player you'll probably get bored after playing a few levels. Playing two player is useful for getting all the gold sculptors, but it could have been something more. The other main mode of the game is adventure mode where you explore the original map from the Legend of Zelda on the NES in a grid view. Every grid has a challenge associated with it which you have to beat to unlock the challenges on adjacent grids. There are also item cards that you win by beating battles that you can use on certain grids to unlock extras. You are also given a rank for each challenge and achieving A ranks gives you bonuses such as health upgrades for certain characters. If you have a hard time swallowing the game's story then you'll probably have a better time with adventure mode as there is a nice retro charm surrounding it all and getting all the A ranks can be addictive if you allow yourself to get sucked in. It's shorter than legends mode but it's a nice way of extending the game's life. Hyrule Warriors truly is a game for the fans. The references in the fanfare to the Legend of Zelda series is laid thick in this game from the large cast of characters to smaller things such as musical cues. If you're not a Zelda fan then I would say there's nothing really here for you. The gameplay is weak in areas but it does work because of the scenarios they create and slicing through hordes of Zelda enemies is enjoyable. As I really like the Legend of Zelda I definitely had fun with this game but it's really hard for me to say whether this game would be good without it being connected to Zelda. I'm admitting my bias here but it's a review, it's supposed to be opinion based. My score is 7.5 out of 10, as a Zelda fan this game offers great fan service even if the gameplay could be stronger.